It's a great pleasure to take part in this workshop and I'm thankful for the invitation. Uh, my presentation, uh, which will focus on the topic of consensual elements in the Greek criminal tax proceedings, aims to outline uh, in the next 20 minutes an extremely complex landscape of provisions which raises many controversial interpretive issues. This is due firstly to the fact that there are in Greece at this time, especially in the field of property, time and customs offences, many different types of provisions which could fall into the general category of provisions that introduce consensual elements in the criminal proceedings. Furthermore, many of those provisions were enacted with the new criminal court and the new code of criminal procedure that entered into force in Greece on the 1st of July 2019 and there is still no sufficient case law analysis for them. For the whole picture to be better understood, I would therefore like to start with some systematic distinctions. Also, before focusing on the tax and customs offences, I would like to give some general information about the broader relevant institutional framework in Greece. As provisions, uh, that introduce consensual elements into the criminal proceedings could be considered, firstly, those which provide for the classic form of negotiation between the prosecutor and the accused, where the object of the negotiation is the crime to be prosecuted and the severity of the sentence to be imposed in exchange for the confession of the accused. For this classic form of negotiation between the prosecuting authority and the accused, with the aim of speeding up the criminal proceedings, I will henceforth use the term plea bargaining. As provisions that introduce consensual elements into the criminal proceedings could also be considered those that promote the conciliation between the victim and the offender, providing for the non-initiation or the termination of criminal proceedings when the perpetrator reaches a settlement with the victim. This result can be achieved in two ways. Firstly, by forming some crimes as crimes which can be prosecuted only upon a complaint filed by the victim, so that the absence or the withdrawal of such a complaint in any stage of the proceedings can function as a reason for hindering those proceedings. Or secondly, by recognizing a special reason for elimination of punishability applicable even on ex officio prosecuted crimes, when the victim declares that he has been fully compensated by the perpetrator. Finally, as provisions that introduce even remotely consensual elements into the criminal proceedings could be considered those which provide for the automatic elimination of punishability when the perpetrator fully restores the damage caused by his crime. The difference from the previous provisions, which may also presuppose the restoration of the victim's damage, is that the restoration could be recognized here as an autonomous reason for non-initiation or termination of criminal proceedings, regardless of the will of the prosecutor or the victim, that is, without a judgment of expediency by the prosecutor or an expression of satisfaction from the victim being necessary. Having the above systematic distinctions as a starting point, I would then like to provide a brief overview of the attitude of the Greek legal order towards using the both possibilities, both in general and in relation to property tax and customs offenses. Greece is one of the countries that faced the introduction of provisions recognizing the institution of plea bargaining with great reservations. The prevailing ideas here were, on the one hand, that such provisions would alter key features of criminal proceedings, such as the search for the essential truth, and on the other hand, that they will transfer excessive power to the prosecutor's office. Greece was also skeptical towards establishing provisions that would make the initiation of criminal proceedings dependent on a victim's complaint so that the victim's will not to file or to withdraw a complaint could hinder, could hinder the prosecution of a crime. In the case of property offenses, for example, such a regulation was provided only for offenses between family members or for offenses that caused very little financial damage. On the contrary, the Greek legislator was traditionally in favor of provisions providing for the elimination of punishability 
when the perpetrator restored the victim's damage before having been examined for his crime by any prosecuting authority. This favorable treatment was justified here mainly by the admission that the voluntary restoration of the damage by the perpetrator before his crime was revealed made it unnecessary to impose on him any punishment in the light of the needs of special prevention. Therefore, the restoration could not eliminate punishability if it took place after the offender's examination for his crime, but it could be still considered as a mitigating circumstance and lead to a reduction of the sentence. The only provisions which could not be justified based on the above argumentation, which connected the provided benefit with the needs of special prevention, were until 1999 the tax offenses. The respective legislation provided for the elimination of punishability, even if the perpetrator restored the damage caused to the state after the revelation of his crime. It was sufficient if he restored the damage, paying back the evaded tax and any administrative financial sanctions imposed on him for his violation, drawing up a kind of definite settlement with the tax authorities before the end of the administrative proceedings. The process of drawing up this settlement, which could cover all tax offenses regardless of gravity, was regulated in detail by tax law and took place without any involvement of the prosecutor's office and the criminal courts. The above settlement procedure did not, however, apply to customs offenses. In customs law existed just a narrow conduct regu regulation which provided for the elimination of punishability only when the evaded tax did not exceed a certain monetary threshold. The above picture, that is, the rejection and principle of the institution of plea bargaining, the limited recognition of crimes which could be prosecuted only upon a complaint by the victim, and the recognition of the damage compensation as a ground for eliminating punishability only in cases that it took place before any examination of the perpetrator for his crime, with exceptions provided only for tax offenses, this picture also has begun to gradually alter over the last 20 years, mainly in relation to property offenses. Thus, the Greek legislator gradually began with provisions inserted in the criminal code and in the code of criminal procedure to provide benefits to the perpetrator, even in cases where the damage restoration took place after the revelation of the property crime, provided that the victim would also state that he has been fully satisfied. This trend started with the property misdemeanors in 1999 and was extended to all property crimes, even the felonies, in 2010. Thus, the conciliation between the perpetrator and the victim, as it was manifested by the victim's statement about his complete satisfaction, began to be recognized as an additional independent reason for the exclusion or restriction of criminal punishment. The above trend, which started in 1999, picked with the two new codes, the Criminal Code and the Code of Criminal Procedure, that came into force in Greece on the 1st July of 2019. They now provide for a multitude of overlapping institutions, falling either within the realm of substantive or within the realm of procedural criminal law, which have as a common feature that they recognize the restoration of damages as a very decisive factor for criminal proceedings, particularly. First, According to Article 381 and 405 of the New Criminal Code, the perpetrator is to be acquitted for all property crimes which do not involve violence, for example, theft, embezzlement, fraud, breach of trust, but not robbery or extortion, if he restores the damage caused to the victim before his case being irrevocably referred to be tried by a criminal court. Moreover, if the committed offence is the misdemeanor, that is a crime threatened with a maximum sentence of five years imprisonment, the acquittal is obligatory even if the damage restoration takes place after the indictment and until the end of the evidentiary procedure in the first instance. It is characteristic that the new law does not require either a statement of satisfaction by the victim or any concept 
by the prosecutor for the acquittal. It is sufficient that the perpetrator restores the damage within the aforementioned time limits. The set provisions do not, however, cover tax and customs offenses. Second, according to the same articles of the new criminal code, many property crimes that do not involve violence, for example, embezzlement and fraud, even if they are felonies, can now be prosecuted only upon a complaint filed by the victim within three months after the victim has gotten knowledge about the crime and the identity of the perpetrator. Moreover, the victim, even if he has filed a complaint and has given rise to the initiation of criminal proceedings, may at any time terminate those proceedings before a rescue decata is produced by withdrawing his complaint. However, crimes against the state or the EU are excluded from the said rule when the damage cost exceeds the amount of 120,000 euros. The general rule of ex officio prosecution has been maintained, moreover, for all tax and customs offenses. Third, according to Articles 48 and 49 of the new Code of Criminal Procedure, if the perpetrator restores the damage before criminal proceedings are initiated, the prosecutor may, at his request, abstain from criminal prosecution. The victim is asked about it, but the decision belongs exclusively to the prosecutor and does not depend on the victim's will. Those provisions cover all property offenses, which do not involve violence, but also accompanying offenses, such as those of forgery, false certification, or money laundering, that are not covered by the provisions of the new criminal code. They also apply to tax and customs offenses. Additionally, for property offenses that do not involve violence, there is a more specific provision, Article 50 of the new Code of Criminal Procedure, that makes it mandatory for the prosecutor to abstain from initiating criminal proceedings, provided that the victim declares that he has been fully satisfied by the perpetrator. Fourth, according to Article 301 and 302 of the new Code of Criminal Procedure, after the initiation of criminal proceedings, during the whole pretrial phase, and until the completion of the evidentiary process in the first instance, if the accused wants to restore the damage and submits a relevant request to the prosecutor, there is the possibility for opening a specific conciliation procedure between the accused and the victim with the mediation of the prosecutor. If the conciliation procedure is successful and the damage is restored, a special report is drawn up and the case is brought immediately before a court, which can impose on the accused, even in the case of felonies, a maximum sentence of up to three years imprisonment that is always to be suspended. The said provisions about the conciliation procedure cover all property offenses, which do not involve violence, accompanying offenses such as forgery, false certification, or money laundering, as well as tax and customs offenses. Fifth, and finally, according to Article 303 of the new Code of Criminal Procedure, for most offenses, even if they are not of a property nature, with a few exemptions, for example, murder, murder, terrorist offenses, or sexual offenses, there is the possibility of a plea bargaining between the accused and the prosecutor. The sentence agreed upon within the framework set by the legislator must then be ratified by a court. In the field of property or tax crimes, however, recourse to the above procedure of plea bargaining only makes sense when it comes to property crimes involving violence or crimes where it has not been possible to fully restore the damage or obtain the victim's agreement. Since for the rest cases, the conciliation procedure of Articles 301 and 302 of the Code of Criminal Procedure is more favorable. As for the tax uh, offenses, as far as the tax offenses are concerned, it is not clear whether they can still claim, in addition to the benefits provided by the set new provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure, a special possibility for elimination of punishability when the accused pays voluntarily all due tax and administrative fines imposed upon him before the administrative proceedings come to an end. As mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, the tax legislation provided traditionally for a special tax settlement procedure between the tax authorities and the offender, which explicitly 
led to the elimination of punishability without any involvement of the prosecutor's office. That special tax law procedure has been abolished from the 1st of January 2014. In view of this abolition, in the current case law of the criminal courts, seems to prevail the view that for offenses committed from the 1st of January 2014 onwards, there is no longer any possibility for eliminating punishability by voluntarily paying all due tax and administrative fines. However, this view is disputed in literature as the special tax settlement procedure has been abolished, but a special criminal provision has remained in force, which provides for the elimination of punishability if the tax dispute is resolved consensually, not only by a tax settlement, but also in any other definite manner. The literature thus supports the view that under that provision, the full payment of the tax debt by the offender and his waiver regarding legal remedies against the relevant tax administrative act may still lead to the elimination of punishability. It is pointed out, among other things, that if this was not accepted, then tax offenses, in contrast to the past, would now be subject to more unfavorable treatment than other property crimes against the state, for example, theft, embezzlement, fraud, or breach of trust, since for the latter now apply the extremely favorable provisions of the new criminal code, which do not include tax offenses. And I come to some final critical evaluation thoughts. What has been presented so far compose an extremely dense regulatory landscape with provisions that overlap to a large extent in their scope, each leading to partly different results, as some provide for the elimination of punishability, some for the abstention from prosecution, some for the release of an acquittal judgment, and others for the imposition of a significantly reduced sentence. These findings, however, relate more to the intrasystematic coherence of the new provisions and the related interpretive difficulties, which are expected to be gradually resolved during the implementation by the courts. From a comparative point of view, what is of great, in what is of great interest is not so much the difficulties in delimiting and interpreting the above provisions, as the general direction which they indicate. That is, the recognition of institutions which provide for the fully or partially retreat of the state criminal claims regarding the punishment of property tax and other accompanying offenses, when the perpetrator restores voluntarily the damages he has caused or succeeds in reconciling with the victim. The legitimacy of the above legislative choices under theoretical or criminal policy aspects is by no means self-evident. In particular, in the light of the requirements of general and specific prevention of crimes, which is the main purpose of criminal law, the various new regulations that have been mentioned can create the feeling that property crimes do not in fact pose any risk for the perpetrator as long as he has sufficient reserves to cover the damages he causes if his actions are finally revealed and prosecuted. Such a feeling could be extremely damaging in terms of tackling organized financial crime. However, the will of the Greek legislator during the introduction of the above regulations was on the one hand to relieve the criminal courts from cases that are often of a civil law nature, and on the other hand, to strengthen the role of criminal law as a tool for restoring the damages caused to the victim by financial crimes. The future will show whether this was, in terms of anti-crime policy, a successful or a failed choice. Thank you very much for your kind attention.